process, winner of 15 New York and Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights. I have great both personal and professional respect for Justice Wallace. I just believe that if you look at his overall body of work, that it represents a different philosophy. That philosophy being that it is okay to legislate from the bench. I don't believe it is. And with that declaration that he would not reappoint Justice Wallace to the state Supreme Court, Governor Christie set off a firestorm. It's led to condemnation from the bar, resistance from the Senate president, and cries of a crisis in judicial independence. It's also drawn some applause. We'll hear from both sides on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding provided by the PSCG Foundation and the Thomas and Agnes Carvel Foundation. He was considered a moderate on the state Supreme Court, a low-key reserved justice, an unlikely figure to find himself the center of controversy. But when Governor Christie refused to reappoint him to serve the 22 months leading up to his retirement, Justice John Wallace became a public figure in a way he'd never been on the bench. I'm Raymond Brown, and on this edition of Due Process, the opening salvo in the Christie plan to change the court and the resulting pushback. We'll hear the arguments for and against from a former attorney general, and bar presidents past and present. But first, as always, Sandy King sets the stage. Raymond, even Chris Christie says he likes John Wallace. But as he told us during his run for governor, he's a man on a mission. He knows what he wants to change about New Jersey and among his prime targets, a court he considers too far to the left, too liberal, and to blame for our system of school funding. So the forced exit of Justice Wallace was a far cry from the celebration that marked his entrance seven years before. Hi, Johnny Wallace, Jr. It is important that citizens of all walks of life be able to see and interact with people that look like themselves. And Justice John Wallace, himself just the second African American to sit on the state Supreme Court, a position he could not have imagined as a 22-year-old graduate of the University of Delaware. We attended football games together before. So I have great both personal and professional respect for Justice Wallace. A position he would lose when a fellow Delaware alum forced him into I early retirement. Look at his overall body of work, that it represents a different philosophy. That philosophy being that it is okay to legislate from the bench. I don't believe it is. It's just part one of the declared Chris Christie plan to shake up business as usual in New Jersey in the interest of change. In this case, step one in transforming what he sees as a liberal activist court. So it would be completely inconsistent for me now as governor to reappoint someone who I believe participated in putting this court in a direction that I thought was inappropriate. Those were fighting words in some quarters of the bar. Quite frankly, I was appalled by that response. And the bench and the civil rights sector. To the NAACP, this is a slap in the face. And what frightens me now is that there are a number of these things that I've talked about that are tradition and that a first incursion is a frightening thing. I no longer feel that I can take for granted the system that we have in New Jersey. 
And it would seem that's just the gauntlet that the governor has thrown down. You know, from my perspective, the court, over the course of the last three decades, um, has gotten out of control and inappropriately invaded the executive and legislative constitutional functions. And the only way to change the court is to change its members. This is his first opportunity to do so, uh, and he's fulfilled a campaign promise. Uh, he has four appointments coming up in his first term, uh, which would be a majority of the court, uh, and Wallace happens to be the first one. Greg Sullivan's voice has been one of the few raised publicly in support of the governor's move on Justice Wallace. Former Attorney General John Dagnan, a Democrat who served under Brendan Byrne, is another. Well, the governor really under the Constitution has only one way to express effectively his concern about whether the judiciary is exceeding the bounds of its permissible authority, and that's in the appointment process. But there was a distinctly different appraisal at the New Jersey Law Center when nearly 200 lawyers, judges, and even former justices came together in condemnation. I think in the African-American community, you have a community who is not only disappointed, but is outraged by the fact that the governor did not see fit to reappoint Justice Wallace, who was eminently qualified. Governor Christie hadn't broken any law, but he had broken with six decades of tradition. Six decades during which every New Jersey governor gave the nod to every justice who stood for reappointment, irrespective of party, philosophy, or position on the issues. One of the things that I found myself thinking about a great deal recently, how proud I've been and the speeches I've given about judicial independence and why the New Jersey court system is an exemplary system. This is such an affront to our history, to our traditions, and to the excellence of the New Jersey judiciary that I know that this is not an argument this governor can ever win on the merits. The argument goes back to Abbott versus Burke and a series of court decisions on school equality and school funding. Decisions that epitomize what the governor sees as a runaway court. New Jersey has suffered mightily because of some of the decisions of the court which would, in my view, have been much more appropriately resolved by the legislative and executive branches. I think the governor has to explain it, not just that he doesn't like Abbott v. Burke. Uh, I don't think that was a sufficient reason for it, particularly when, when uh, Justice Wallace had nothing to do with Abbott v. Burke. Governor Christie's indicated that he's made his decision, he's not going to turn back on it, so we'll see what happens. Uh, ultimately, voters, uh, this issue will be handed to voters and they'll decide uh, uh, who's right. Well, the president of the state Senate, Steve Sweeney, has already decided who he thinks is right, and he thinks the governor is so wrong that he's refused even to allow confirmation hearings for Christie's choice for the Wallace seat. Chief Justice Stuart Rabner uncharacteristically spoke out against the governor's move on Wallace, and the majority of the state's retired Supreme Court justices have made their feelings known, too. In fact, four of them, including Chief Poritz, whom we saw on the tape piece, were part of a judicial advisory panel which resigned in protest over Wallace. And Raymond, you moderated that forum where much of the bar leadership, legal academics, and former judges seemed solidly in opposition to what they insist is an assault on judicial independence. And they would seem to represent the majority of the Jersey bar, but there are more opinions on this critical, controversial matter, and you'll hear them when we come back, so stay with us. the governor he wants to leave his imprint on the Supreme Court who will make decisions that will affect the state uh, I think it's disgraceful um, to be honest with you I think he's really mixing uh, politics into the judiciary system I'm not so sure I think that's it's an interesting decision uh, and I don't really agree with it uh, I don't really have an opinion in regards to that uh, but I'm in favor of uh, a good amount of things uh, Governor Christie has been doing well that's his decision that you know he had to make and uh, 
if he thinks it's the right decision, I trust him. He can't give a reason why. It's a personal vendetta or racism. Hey, he's trying to change everything and fix things, so maybe give him some credit for trying something new. So does the governor deserve credit or condemnation for his move on Justice Wallace? We'll hear some very different answers from a very distinguished panel. Here in Trenton, State Bar Association President Richard Steen and former federal prosecutor Eric Hasso, an active member of the Federalist Society and the Hispanic Bar. In Newark, former State Bar President Carol Corbin Walker, the first black woman partner in a major New Jersey firm. And with us from the studio at the Chubb Corporation, where he serves as COO, former State Attorney General John Dignan. Thank all of you for being with us. Eric, let me start from you. Uh, what was your response when you first heard of the governor's decision concerning Justice Wallace? Certainly not one of surprise. Uh, Chris Christie ran for governor on a platform that included, that basically was based on changing Trenton. And uh, one of the things he said quite clearly during the campaign is that he felt that the current Supreme Court, all of it. Right. Was Were you pleased with that decision? Well, it's his decision to make. Uh, I, I don't think that it would be appropriate for me to say whether this was, you know, the right thing to do with this justice or not. But, you know, I think that the question here is whether he had the power to do it. Well, let me look at two parts of this. One is that, th first of all, there's been a huge debate since this, certainly within the judicial and legal community. And the two points of contention are, one, whether or not the governor should do that, that is, whether he should reappoint justices, as has been the tradition. And secondly, whether or not this particular decision was warranted, given Justice Wallace's performance on the bench. It's are there either one of those on which you have an opinion? It was the right thing for him to do, given what he said he was going to do during the campaign. He said, quite broadly, that he was going to use all powers available to the governor, legal powers, constitutional powers, to effectuate change in Trenton. He saw the Supreme Court as part of the problem. Right. And so, without passing judgment, as I think he, the governor pointed out in your intro, on the bona fides of Justice Wallace's distinguished career, he said in the campaign, and won the campaign based in part on saying that he was going to change the membership of the court. Rick, your reaction? Uh, my, I was I was shocked. I was uh, in, it was it was known for some time that it was under consideration. But I think the the uh, history and the tradition of never having had a sitting justice not reappointed. And what's the, why tenure. is that tradition important? I mean, it's clear from the Constitution that the governor has the power to do this. Why then should a tradition that suggests to the contrary be respected in your view? Uh, it, it, it's important, I think, because of the quality and the national reputation that this court enjoys, and it has enjoyed and has, has earned that reputation based on the uh, years since the most recent Constitution and the operation of the court. And I think we will continue to enjoy a national reputation in the future. However, I think this decision opens up a wide variety of questions nobody has answers to other than that time will tell about how this is going to affect the operation of the court, how it's going to affect lower court judges, and how it's going to affect the judicial system. John Dignan, you're a former attorney general, which means we respect both your legal and your political acumen. Uh, one of the claims that's been made is that this undermines the tradition and the respect that many have had for the New Jersey Supreme Court. Do you agree or disagree? I don't agree with that. You know, the Constitution gives the governor uh, uncontrolled discretion over whether to make a reappointment uh, in the same fashion he makes an appointment. I frankly thought his decision here, while it was unfortunate in its impact on a justice that we all respect and admire, was a bold decision that reflects his concern about whether this court over the last several decades has become too activist a judicial body in intervening in matters that are more appropriately left to the legislature or the executive. Good for the governor for raising the issue. I hope that the dialogue uh, that the Bar Association uh, conducts in the future will focus on that important question rather than the personality. Well, the question of whether or not this is a quid pro quo, that is, uh, an argument by the governor that he's removing a justice because of a view on a particular case. Does that argument have any validity to you? And if so, how do you respond to that? Well, first of all, he's not removing a justice because of his ruling on a particular case, Ray. I, I don't think that's a fair characterization of what he said. What he said, John, and let me, frankly, let me just I think... just flesh it out so you can f 
respond sure. fully. In Robbinsville, he explicitly said that school funding was the reason for his decision concerning Justice Wallace. Obviously, it's broader than that, but he did focus on that particular issue, which is now before the court and has been for some time. Mm -hmm. I think he used, and I think it's appropriate to do so, the court's many decisions in Abbott versus uh, Burke and Robinson versus Cahill uh, to express his concern about whether the court has become too activist. In effect, the court has made itself the czar of education in New Jersey by shifting from determining uh, equality of funding to education to approving programmatic uh, de decisions that more appropriately lie with the executive and the legislative branch. And, my judgment, uh, I don't think that the court intentionally infringed upon the right of the other two branches of government, but I think the effect has been to do so in that case. And maybe the court needs to be reminded that the respect to which it is entitled is based on the legitimacy with which it is viewed. Um, you, I see evidence of that in the writings of Archibald Cox, who I had as a professor in law school, who talks about the important role of the judiciary as a bulwark against the excessive abuse of the other two branches of government, but says it will only be effective if its rulings are viewed as legitimate. Do we really want the Supreme Court of this state deciding how many faucets should be available to kids in a classroom to wash their hands, or how art should be delivered as an educational programmatic improvement? That's not, in my judgment, the appropriate role of a court, yeah, and yet the court has has let me, let me bring role. Carol in. We'll come back to you. Carol, do you agree with John's assessment that what the governor was doing was protecting uh, the executive branch against abuses by the judiciary in terms of overstepping its bounds? Is that what was going on? Absolutely not. My concern, and I think the concern of the entire bar, is that the governor's decision not to reappoint Justice Wallace was a direct infringement upon judicial independence within the state of New Jersey. When we talk about judicial independence, it's not for the protection of the judge, but rather the protection of us, the people, the citizens, who are the beneficiaries of the court's business. And every judge on that court is required to uphold the oath that they took to Car render Carol, let me ask you a fair, point. let me just finish this, sure, Ray, to sure, render sure. a fair and impartial decision applying the law and the facts without intrusion or influence from political intimidation or other outside influences. And but that's is there exactly a response what has to happened John's here. claim that the political branches are being in some way impinged upon by the court? Because that's really, and is that what the governor was talking about in his act of non-reappointing Wallace? I disagree with that concept. When you look at the three branches of government, legislative, judicial, and executive, the judicial branch is the weakest as far as having power and influence. We as the people must defend the judiciary because judges cannot defend themselves. So when you talk about political influence and power, I submit that the weakest of the three branches is the judicial. So I do not agree with John's concept that the court has overstepped its bounds and power with respect to this branch. Okay, forgive my interrupting, but there's so many things I want to cover with this wonderful panel. Rick, one of the comments in criticism of the Governor's Act has been the notion that this has the capacity to intimidate or to affect judgments of judges in the inferior courts, the superior courts. So the focus of the debate hasn't just been about the Supreme Court. Do you think there is the potential for this to have an impact on superior court judges? Uh, it certainly can have an impact, and, and I'm aware that judges who don't have tenure are concerned about what that impact might be. The discussions have been amongst the bar and certainly amongst the judges, how is this new game going, what are the rules of the new game? How is, how is my performance going to be judged when I'm considered for reappointment? It won't be just the traditional factors of legal ability and knowledge and the traditional factors of competence and integrity and impartiality uh, and temperament. It will be all of those things plus perhaps 
something else. Eric, let me bring up an issue that has been raised in this debate, the question of race. Uh, a number of people have suggested that it's important to have a cross-section of the state represented on the bench. Obviously, the removal of Justice Wallace and the potential appointment of someone who's not an African-American changes that balance. Is that a valid consideration in the process of selecting either for initial or reappointment persons to the court? Well, I think we've come a long way in that race really doesn't matter. And I think it's a bit of a red herring to say that uh, the governor singled out uh, Justice Wallace because of his race. Uh, he has made uh, a great effort to uh, praise Justice Wallace as a pioneer, right, as, a, as, as have the Bar Association. But I think that the thing I want to point out is that who has not been mentioned in this, in this entire debate, debate is Ann P Patterson. But Ann, Ann Patterson is a very, let let me go, but is, before, is a very distinguished... Before we get to Ann, let me go back to my question. The question is, is it a legitimate factor to be considered by a governor, by the Senate, and by the public in looking at appointments to the court is race. If, for example, uh, Justice Rivera Soto is involved in a potential reappointment controversy, is the question of the fact that he's a Latino relevant to that discussion? Well, I can speak as someone who's been involved in the Hispanic Bar Association as an Hispanic. Uh, it's a matter of great pride that Justice Rivera Soto is on the Supreme Court. So yes, is it, is it a, is an appropriate factor for a governor to decide? Yes. But the most important thing for the governor is what is the court doing and not how it looks. And I think that is what Chris Christie is focused on. And he has been very clear about that all along. Uh, John, let me go back to you and say uh, it's clear that among the places you stand is on the state constitution. The governor has the right to do this. Um, the Senate president has said he won't hold hearings. Uh, is it your feeling that that's equally legitimate as a legal act? Or uh, do you think that stands differently than from the governor's decision? Well, I think it's different. The Constitution says that the State Senate shall advise and consent on a nomination by the governor to the appointment. For the Senate to refuse to even hold hearings and address the kinds of issues the governor has raised, I think is an abdication by the Senate of its constitutional authority. I was very surprised to see the law journals support that when they've opposed senatorial courtesy uh, again and again. Carol, but, what you're so uh, there are different points. If uh, I can Carol, make one point to Carol's... Let me come back, uh, John. Let me just make one. Okay. Carol, if you can quickly give me your response to John's position on the Sweeney position, which is no hearings. I agree with the decision of President Sweeney and the Legislative Senate of not addressing this nomination. I do not agree with John's assessment that it's an abdication of their rights and responsibility. I totally agree with the editorial that right. the Carol, Star Ledger we, issued. Carol, we, we're down to our last couple seconds. John, I know you wanted to say something. I cut you off. Go ahead. I agree with Carol that the judicial branch is the weakest of the three, but that's why it's so important that the judicial branch realize the concept of self-restraint and judicial restraint. When a court impinges upon the authority of the other two branches of government, there's only one way for a governor to push back, and that's in the appointment authority. Right, Chris Christie's raised a legitimate question here, and we ought to join the right. issue. Rick, at the end of the day, what are you most concerned about in terms of long-term consequences of this act by the governor? I, I think the long-term consequences, and I just want to point out something that John said. The, the You've got a minute in which to do it. All three governors, all three branches of government are controlled by the Constitution. If the legislature acts or fails to act, it, the court is the last resort for the public in the state of New Jersey. And I think they've, they've carried out that responsibility very well. But 10 years from now, will we be, as a polity, still concerned about this act? Long term, 10 years from now, we will have a different governor. I think that the fact that this can happen, the fact that this has happened, the state bar has, has uh, come out against and spoken out against senatorial courtesy on and off over the years in various right. situations. Does right. this Let me see if I can squeeze everybody in. Okay. Eric, long-term consequences either way from this, better, good or bad, are there likely to be long-term ramifications? Well, I think that this academic debate is very interesting, but I have to make the point about... Well, you've only got uh, about two seconds, so... Ann, Ann Patterson should be the focus of this debate. Right. She is a qualified John, person. John, long-term consequences or not from this? I think for the better, if we can get the court to focus on its appropriate role and, and be guided. And Carol, and literally yes better. or no, long-term consequences. Awful, horrendous. Okay. Thank you. Sounds long-term. Anyway, with my thanks to Rick Steen, to John Degnan, to Eric Hasso, 
to Carol Corbin Walker. That's it for this edition. But before we go, it's yet another win for due process. This time, the Best of the Best Award from the New Jersey Broadcasters Association for our two-show special on the crisis on the cell block. For Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. judiciary is to be independent, then the judges that decide issues like school funding can't be looking over their shoulder in fear that if they decide the case incorrectly, they're not going to be reappointed. And they may have to go out and look for work. This is not about anybody looking over their shoulder. This is about acquitting their responsibilities in the way they believe appropriate. But as governor, I have to put my responsibilities the way I believe appropriate as well. I have a significant constitutional role to play here. And I've made the evaluation philosophically from a constitutional perspective that the direction the court has taken is inappropriate. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. And by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding provided by the PSCG Foundation. And the Thomas and Agnes Carvel Foundation.